The Book of Recollections, Episode 13, Sacrifice, by Dysylvania. Hello again! I'm in the Book of Recollections! Yada, yada, yada. You know the drill. Let's get down to business. Time is short, at least for some of the people in the story. With Jovis's trial showcased to the remaining competitors, Leo took a moment to address Prince Philip, telling him that although he helped the boy complete his first task, he pledged himself to Evander first. That saddened the young prince who told Leo that he might never trust again and, if he would win, he would remove him from his chancellor position. Returning to his friends, Leo found them sharing every scrap of knowledge they had regarding Joy Marita and how one might be able to summon her. As they recount these random bits and pieces, Castiel remembered the fact that Joy Marita is an ancient being who predates the Hebdomads and who would manifest herself on the third day of the week as a hag. Furthermore, Joy Marita apparently had ties to the idea of sewing and weaving, being vehemently opposed to laziness. In the middle of their discussion, Shaq caught an unusual scent coming from the direction of Lena, Prince Emric and Philip, as a dark shadow bearing the resemblance of the legend engulfed him and, taken by surprise, the snake folk was swooped up by the bird. Although the group sprung into action, legend's speed was too great even for Genevieve. The kidnapping of Shaklashak caused Evander to approach Prince Emric and ask him what just happened. Although frustrated, the half-elf retained his composure and diplomatic skills throughout the conversation. Emric had no clue as to where Shaq was being taken or why the legend acted in such a way, reiterating that although he employed his help in the first trial, the bird was a sentient being and only it knew why it acted in a such manner. But sentient or not, Evander tried to play Shaklashak's displacement to his advantage. If the snake folk wasn't returned to him in four days' time, Prince Emric should forfeit the trials. But because Shaq wasn't officially named as part of Evander's retinue, this request held little ground, although the prince reassured the half-elf that he would try and find out what happened to his friend and, if possible, bring him back. This sudden drama sprung Prince Philip into announcing that he didn't need the help of his retinue, dismissing them from his service. Not even his brother's words were enough to dissuade the boy. I wouldn't be so harsh on the little prince. After all, not only did he witness the death of his older brother, but he was also discarded by Leo, with whom he had a fun connection. But what do I know of human relationships and emotions? I'm just a book, right? Lena invited Evander to join her for a one-on-one -on -one discussion in which she wanted to thank him for taking her side in front of the Hebdomads and allowing her to further compete in the trials. In order to repay his kindness, Lena shared her strategy with Evander, telling him that herself and her retinue would go into the forest and simply laze around for four days. Their discussion turned into an alliance and a mutual understanding between the competitors, which Lena was more than interested in. Especially seeing how Monkey's decision to retrieve his friends from the end of the world left her without most of her retinue. Wanting to further discuss the terms of the alliance, Lena gestured towards Prince Emric to join. Their talk was mostly focused on Prince Philip, his safety and the fact that indeed he wouldn't be fit as a king due to his young age. Although the probability of harm remained high, Prince Emric decided that it would be better for his little brother to be part of the group. If they managed to get their hands on the three hearts of Joy Marita, he would be the one to explain to Philip that he wouldn't be receiving one. Prince Emric's decision also came due to Jovis's kind nature and the fact that he probably wouldn't punish Philip for not finishing his trial. 
Around that time, Monkey approached Castile, who was not that pleased by the mercenary's flamboyant nature. Upon hearing Monkey's request to borrow Humaness in order to retrieve his friends, Castile, after a brief session of passive-aggressive words, allowed the man to employ the help of Humaness on two conditions. No harm would come to her, and Monkey would have to take a branch from the tree and place it in a bottle of water. With Monkey out of the picture, Castile turned his attention to the Queen, observing her from a distance. Only for a moment did the grieving mother take her eyes off her deceased child in order to respond to one of her servants, and Castile seized the opportunity and summoned his familiar in the guise of a snake. The serpent slithered towards Prince Finian's body. Although I'm a big fan of Castile's uh, colorful nature, I fear you must go and check out what he did on your own. It's juicy, it's revolting, and it's a wonderful display of uh, creativity. Morbid, yes, but nonetheless creative and intriguing. With the snake's return, Castile took Finian's heart and, to ensure that it remained fresh, he used magic creating a fleshy shell around it, sheltering it from decay. With this prize in his possession, Castile went to the royal stables to fetch Humaness, where he was met by Monkey. The two exchanged a few words and, before departing, Monkey offered the man a book wrapped in leather, explaining that it should only be touched through magical means. With little time to spare, the competitors left to get a few moments of rest before heading into the woods. This momentary respite found Prince Emric in the midnight forest praying over the altar of Hugen and Munin in search for answers. As the two mythical ravens showed themselves to Emric, he once again felt the same chill going down his spine. Although reluctant to offer a straight answer to Emric's inquiry of legend's whereabouts, they told him that one of the champions had to be devoured. Still, the snake folk and the raven were no safer than the others, for it was time. Using his diplomatic skills, shapen from an early age, Emric was able to extract a bit more information, finding out that there were three pawns in this unseen game, Shaklashak serving Jormungandr, Legend serving the two ravens, and Livia serving someone else and that one of these three had to die. The two ravens assured the prince that legend had no intention of killing Shaq, yet. Emric left the midnight forest making his way to the Purple Road, which was designated as the meeting point for the Alliance. But not before going home and picking Prince Philip up from his bed and placing him on Stella's back. Together, they steadily made their way to their destination, there, they found Lena accompanied by Arches, alongside Evander and his retinue. Wanting to put Evander's mind at ease, Emric related what the two ravens had told him about the snake folk. With everyone ready, they left through the city gates and began making their way towards the green forest. After an hour into their journey, the group started wondering whether or not they were far enough in the forest. After much consideration, Leo displayed his knack for history, telling everyone that, in the past, the green forest was much larger and by that time they should have traveled far enough. That was sufficient to make Lena stop and pitch her camp, being quickly followed by everyone else. For four days they did nothing, dishes were strewn about their camp, trash was piling up, and the smell of spoiled food and unwashed clothes lingered in the air as laziness was felt by everyone, except Castiel and the young prince. Castiel, in order to ensure that true laziness would be achieved, was put in charge of the camp, making sure to constantly bark orders at the group and appoint tasks that would never come to fruition. Prince Philip, due to his young age, was filled with energy, telling his brother that what they did was boring. 
By giving the young cub the impression that he had come up with that idea, the boy did his best to keep the facade of laziness. On the fourth day, the group was surprised to see the image of a crone making her way towards them and, after chastising them, she snapped her fingers and set their feet and hands ablaze for a few moments. Everyone sprung up, except Castiel, whom the hag magically teleported back to Greenspring. No doubt, because he showed all but laziness. Frustrated, Castiel summoned his skeletal steed and dashed back into the woods. The Hag of the Woods ordered the slots to start weaving or suffer the flame, and as they did, the threads of fate became visible for all to see, wrapping themselves around each member of the group. But to the Hag's amazement and disgust, Grace had no such thread, prompting the old woman to scold her calling her a sin and an abomination. Although Evander intervened and tried to take the heat off Grace, this did little to dissuade the crone. As the others began weaving, their strings took on different colors, holding within them their past, present and future, until they entangled themselves and turned crimson. Amidst the woven threads of fate, the hag discovered the prophecy, which talked about the demise of the world which would come with a radiant glow and a crimson string linked to the first king. It's true because it rhymes! Before the hag got away from the group, our protagonists saw that at the heart of the woven threads, their fates were tied to a sickle. The group looked at each other and, although they did not feel or perceive anything, they were transported to the heart of the green forest. Except for Grace, who was nowhere to be seen. When Castiel found her a few moments later, she was visibly shaken and her self-loathing bubbled up, brought to the tipping point by the hag's harsh words and the fact that their friends were aware that she was different. Before Castiel held her up on his steed, he assured her that she was nothing more than a person who owed him money. Ah, Castiel's reassurance always hit home. Well, not hit, but punch one back into their senses. Those who were transported to Joy Maritza's domain were in awe at the sight of a tall tree with an altar at its base and a giant hole around its top. As Joy Maritza made her way to the altar, the group saw she was wearing a necklace bearing three totems with the names Amarantha, Corvessa and Tadian. Leo realized those were children's names which had a tie to the word heart. Addressing the crone, the group told her that they were looking for her three hearts and that after the trial was over, they would be returned to her. Joy Maritza disclosed that, indeed, she had three children, which were her hearts, but an exchange had to be made. In exchange for her two daughters, one would receive them only after bringing into existence two other girls with hag blood. And for her boy, a pure sacrifice had to be made, for she required strong bones in order to finish his weapon that would ensure his protection. Emric forced Joy Maritza's hand by headbutting her and trying to climb the tree. The hag's mother instincts sprung into action and with a single blow she incapacitated Emric. To her surprise, what should have killed any number of people left the prince still standing. On the threshold of death, Emric seized the opportunity to nominate himself as the sacrifice only after ensuring that the heart would be received by his younger brother. And after that powerful display, the hag accepted. His final words to his brother were to never give up and to continue his journey because he would make a great king, if not the greatest. As Joy Maritza took Emric's barely breathing body into the forest, Leo made sure to get in front of the now crying Philip, trying to distract and calm him. 
The ripple of Emmerich's cry was so devastating that those present felt as though their souls were slashed by hundreds of sharp knives. Joy Maritza returned with a gauntlet made of bones and leather and, with glee, called out for her son, Tadian, to descend from the tree, telling him that he would accompany Prince Philip back to the city. The question that lingered in the air was, who would take the example of Emric and do what's necessary to complete the trial? This was the recap for episode 13 of Vim, as told by the Book of Recollections. I was Karina Georgescu, your Vim recap narrator. If you'd like to join us as Vim, the Tale of Immortality premieres, tune in on Sunday at 5 p.m. UTC on youtube.com slash at Dysylvania. New recaps drop every Friday evening. And remember, every subscribe keeps the magic alive. Thank you for sticking with us. Good day, good night, and don't let the vampires bite. Blah, blah, blah.